Mexico From the Olmecs to the Aztecs by Dr. Michael Coe and Rex Kuntz Chapter 1 Introduction The ancient cultures of Mexico along with the Maya civilization comprised the larger entity known to archaeologists as quote-unquote Mesoamerica a name first proposed by the anthropologist Paul Kirchhoff and including much of the great constriction that separates the masses of North and South America. Above all, the peoples of Mesoamerica were farmers and had been somewhat isolated for thousands of years from the simpler cultivating societies of the American Southwest and Southeast by the desert wastes of northern Mexico, through which only semi-nomadic hunting aborigines ranged in pre-Spanish times. Beyond the southeastern borders of Mesoamerica laid the petty chiefdoms of Lower Central America, distinguished by a high production of fine ceramics and quantities of jade or gold ornaments, lavishly heaped in the tombs of their great. Further south yet, in Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia, was the Andean area, most noted for its final glory, the immense Inca Empire. But having native civilizations as far back in time as the 10th century before Christ, and large temple constructions even earlier than that. The Andean area and Mesoamerica were the twin peaks of American Indian cultural development, from which must else in the Western Hemisphere seems both peripheral and sometimes derived. Yet this picture may be oversimplified, because recent research in the Pacific lowlands of Ecuador, the Caribbean coast of Colombia, and the upper reaches of the Amazon has shown that the important criteria of settled life agriculture, pottery, and villages may have had a precocious start in those areas. Setting them off from the rest of the New World, the diverse cultures of Mesoamerica shared in a number of features, most of which were pretty much confined to their area. The most distinctive of these is a complicated calendar based upon the permutation of a 260-day sacred cycle with the solar year of 365 days. Others are hieroglyphic writing. The Andean area never developed a script. Bark paper or deerskin books which fold like screens. Maps. An extensive knowledge and use of astronomy. A team game resembling basketball played in a special court with a solid rubber ball. Large, well-organized markets and favored ports of trade. Chocolate beans as money. Wars for the purpose of securing sacrificial victims. Private confession and penance by drawing blood from the ears, tongue, or penis, in a pantheon of extraordinary complexity. Naturally, the peoples of Mesoamerica followed a number of other customs, which are widespread among New World Indians, such as ceremonial tobacco smoking. But their typical method of food preparation, as a unified complex, appears to be unique. The basis of the diet was the foursome of maize, beans, squash, and chili peppers. Maize was, and still is, prepared by boiling it with lime, then grinding the swollen kernels with a handstone, Spanish mono, on a trough or saddle-shaped quern, met metate, from the Nahuatl met metlatl. The resulting dough is either toasted as flat cakes, known in Spanish as tortillas, or else steamed and boiled as tamales. Always and everywhere in Mesoamerica, the hearth comprises three stones, and being the conceptual center of the world, is semi-sacred. On the map, Mexico resembles a great funnel, or rather a cornucopia, with its widest part towards the north and its smallest end twisting to the south and east, meeting there the sudden expansion of the Maya area. There are few regions in the world with such a diverse geography as we find within this area. Mexico is not one, but many countries. All the climatic extremes of our globe are found from Arctic Hole near the summits of the highest volcanoes into the Turkish bath atmosphere of the coastal jungles. Merely to pass from one valley to another is to enter a markedly different ecological zone. This variation would be of interest only to the tourist agencies if one neglected to consider the effect of these contrasts upon the human occupation of Mexico. 
a topsy-turvy landscape of this sort means a similar diversity of natural and cultivated products from region to region. Above all, different crops with different harvest times. It means that no one region is new, or was in the past truly self-sufficient. For the most remote antiquity, there has been an organic interdependence of one zone with the others, of one people or nation with all the rest. Thus, no matter how heterogeneous their, their languages or civilizations, the people of Mexico, through exchange of products, were bound up with each other sim symbiotically into a single line of development. For this reason, great new advances were registered throughout the land within quite brief intervals of time. Most of this funnel-shaped country lies above 3,000 feet or, or 900 meters, with really very little flat land. The Mexican highlands, our major concern in this book, are shaped by the mountain chains that swing down from the north, by the uplands between them, and by numerous volcanoes which have raised their peaks in fairly recent geological times. The western chain, the Sierra Madre Occidental, is the loftiest and broadest of these, being an extension of the Rocky Mountains. It and the Sierra Madre Oriental to the east enclose between their pine-clad ranges an immense inland plateau which is covered by mesquite-studded grasslands and occasionally even approaches true desert. Effectively outside the limits of Mesoamerican farming, the Mexican plateau was the homeland of partially or wholly nomadic hunters and collectors. As we move south, the two Sierras gradually approach each other until the interior wastelands terminate some 300 miles or 480 kilometers north of the Valley of Mexico. The Valley of Mexico, the center of the Aztec Empire, is one of a number of natural basins in the midst of the volcanic Cordillera, an extensive region of intense volcanism and frequent earthquakes a mile and a half high with an area of 3,000 square miles or 7,800 square kilometers, much of the valley was once covered by a shallow lake of roughly figure eight shape, now largely disappeared through ill-advised drainage and general desiccation of central Mexico in post-conquest times. Since the valley of Mexico has no natural outlet, changing rainfall patterns have produced severe fluctuations in the extent of the lake. As will be seen in chapter 10, the Aztec table was amply supplied by foods raised on its swampy margins in the misnamed Floating Gardens, or Chinampas. Surrounded by hills on all sides, the valley is dominated on the southeast by the snowy summits of the volcanoes Popocatepetl, Smoky Mountain, and Itztacuyatl, the White Lady. I apologize for the stammering. Other important sections on the highlands are the Sierra Madre del Sur, its steep escarpment fronting the Pacific shoreline in southern Mexico, in the mountainous uplands of Oaxaca. Both of these fuse to form a highland mass heavily dissected into countless valleys and ranges. Separated from this difficult country by the isthmus of Tehuantepec, the southeastern highlands form a continuous series of ranges from Chiapas down through Maya territory into lower Central America. Although snow falls in some places at infrequent intervals, the Mexican highlands are temperate. Before denundation by man, they were clothed in pines and oaks with true boreal forests in the higher ranges. As everywhere else in Mexico, there are two strongly marked seasons a winter dry period when rain seldom if ever falls, and a summer wet spell. The total rainfall is less than half of that of the lowlands, so that occasionally conditions are arid and somewhat precarious for the farmer, in spite of the general richness of the soil. This is especially true of the boundary zone between the agricultural lands and the northern deserts. The lowlands are confined to relatively narrow strips along the coasts of which the most important is the plain fronting the Gulf of Mexico. Of alluvial origin, this band of flatlands extends unbroken from Louisiana and Texas down through the Mexican states of Tamaulipas, Veracruz, and Tabasco to the Yucatan Peninsula, and played a critical role in the origins of settled life and the growth of civilization in Mexico. 
a bridge between the Gulf Coast Plain and the narrower and less humid Pacific Coast Plain is provided by the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, a constriction in the waste of Mesoamerica with a gentle topography of low hills and sluggish rivers. Lowland temperatures are generally torrid throughout the year except when winter northers come down the Gulf Coast bringing with them cold rains and drizzle. So heavy is the summer precipitation that in many places the soils are red in color and poor in mineral content as a result of drastic leaching. However, when these rains cause flooding of rivers, the soils can be highly productive since they are annually replenished with silt among the natural river levees. The winter dry season is generally well marked so that many of the tropical trees lose their leaves in that season. But where there is an unusually great amount of rain, al along with winter northers, one encounters the evergreen canopies and lush growth of the fully developed rainforest. Dotting the lowlands are patches of savanna grassland, sometimes quite extensive, and of little use to the once plowless Mexican farmer. In response to the opportunities presented by these surroundings, contrasting modes of land cultivation have been developed over the millennia. Highland farmers are quite efficient about their land, since only a moderate period of fallowing is necessary for the fields. On the other hand, many lowland cultivators, faced with immense forests, the low potential of the soil, weed competition, and winter desiccation, have evolved a shifting form of horticulture which they share with other peoples of the world. This system entails the cutting and burning of the forest from the plot to be sown. A very extensive territory is required for the support of each family since exhausted and weed infested fields have to be left fallow for as much as 10 years. Such a mode of food getting could never have supported a large population and we have every evidence to, to suggest a light occupation of much of the lowland zone throughout its history. Nonetheless, it is easy to exaggerate the limitations of the lowlands. There are not one, but many lowland environments, and a diversity of human responses to them. For instance, one could point to the use of fertile river levees by ancient and modern farmers of the southern Gulf Coast Plain, which could have led and did lead to increased population density. Tragically reduced in today's Mexico, game abounded in ancient times. The most important food animals are the white-tailed deer and the collared peccary, found everywhere. Confined to the lowlands are the tapir, the holler monkey, and the spider monkey, all of which are still eaten with relish by the native inhabitants. The lowlands also harbor the now rare jaguar, the largest of the spotted cats, and the source of much desired skins for the nobles of civilized Mexico. It must have been an object of primitive terror to the early dwellers of the coastal plains. Waterfowl, especially ducks, team on the lakes and marshes of the uplands and wild turkeys in the more isolated reaches of the country. Feathers from tropical birds such as the cotinga, the roseate spoonbill, the hummingbird, and above all, the quetzal, with iridescent blue-green plumage, provided rainbow-like splendor for headdresses and other details of costume. The larger highland lakes, such as Lake Patscuaro in Michoacan, in the great lake of the valley of Mexico teem with small fish while the lowland rivers and coasts provided such an abundance of fish such as snook and snappers and turtles that these food resources were more important to ancient peoples than game mammals there were no wild species in the new world suitable for domestication as drought animals the native american horse was exterminated at the end of the ice age probably by human hunters the South American llama is amenable only as a pack animal, and modern efforts to tame the North American bison have shown that beast to be completely intractable. As a consequence, none of the American Indians prior to the European arrival had wheeled vehicles. Ancient Mexico did without any form of overland transportation other than the backs of men, although the principle of the wheel was known and applied to toys and idols of clay. The only warm-blooded animals kept in domestication were the dog and the turkey, the former as well as the latter valuable for its meat. Hives of tiny, stingless bees were exploited for honey by tropical lowlanders. Languages and Peoples 
an amazing number of languages were spoken in native Mexico. The situation would be even more confusing if it had not been for the efforts on the part of linguists to group them into families, of which some 14 have been defined within our area. Of these, the largest and most important to the history of Mexico is Uro Aztecan, comprising dozens of languages distributed from the northwestern United States as far south as Panama. Since the greatest diversity within this family is found in northwestern Mexico, this wild region has been suggested as the probable heartland of the Uro Aztecan peoples. By all odds, the major language group within the Uro Aztecan is Nahua, the most significant member of which is Nahuatl, the language of the Aztecs and the lingua franca of, the em of their empire, still spoken by hundreds of thousands of farmers in the central Mexican highlands and in the state of Guerrero. Since the conquest, Nahuatl has greatly enriched Mexican Spanish with loan words and has contributed to such words as ocelot, coyote, tomato, chocolate, tamale, and copal to the English language. Tarascan or Purepecha, the tongue of a large independent kingdom at the time of the Aztecs centered on Lake Batzcoato in the western part of the volcanic Cordillera is totally unrelated to any other language in the world. Otomipame was spoken by peoples who followed a semi-nomadic way of life to the north of the valley of Mexico on the fringe of Mesoamerica. Totonac is spoken on the middle Gulf Coast, significantly in the region of the old Tajin civilization. Mixtec and Zapotec are the dominant languages in the state of Oaxaca in southern Mexico, and Zapotec written records go back to at least 500 BC. The Mixezokian language family is distributed from the Isthmus of Tehuantepec to the Grijalva Depression, and as we shall see in chapter 5, may have been the language of the ancient Olmecs. Huave was and is spoken by primitive fishermen, now largely turned to cattlemen, on the Pacific coast of the Isthmus. To the east is a large group of Mayan languages. This family has an enigmatic out outlayer, Huastec, in the area of the Gulf Coast north of the Tontanac that is called, naturally enough, the Huasteca. The location of Huastec remains a puzzle for Mesoamericanists. Evidence from the branch of linguistic research known as glottochronology or lexicostatistics suggests that it separated from the main group of Mayan languages about 900 BC, but what this means for the development of Mesoamerican cultures has yet to be ascertained. It would be a fruitless task to try to reconstruct Mexican history merely on the basis of these distributions. Nevertheless, it is evident that the expansion of Udo Aztecans throughout much of Mexico must have been drastic. The isolated islands of Nahua speech, as far south as Lower Central America, Nahua place names, and the presence of Nahua words in many other languages testify to large-scale movements of peoples. We know this in the case of Nahua conquests and migrations having taken place long before the imperialism of the Nahuatl-speaking Aztecs, events recorded in the traditional histories of these peoples. The role that they have played on the stage of New World history has certainly been in the grand style. Other peoples have probably been more sedentary, but, contradictory as it may seem, while there is a fairly good knowledge of the geographic position of most language groups in Mexico at the time of the conquest, Archaeologists are often loath to apply linguistic names to past civilizations unless they are sure beyond any doubt of the identification, as in the case of the Zapotecs and the Maya, whose writings we have, or the Aztecs. Stones and pottery fragments do not tell us who made them, so that we must be content with the non-committal names which archaeologists have given us for past peoples. Periods the Aztecs encountered by the Spanish conquistadores and missionaries knew that they had not been the first occupants of the land of Mexico. Time and time again they told their interlocutors that they had been preceded by a marvelous people called the Toltecs, the people from Tolan. And beyond that epoch lay a mystical never-never land known as Tamuanchan, a paradise inhabited by the gods and ancestors of humans. Further, the Aztec thinkers said that the world had been created and destroyed four times, and that we were now living in the age 
The fifth age, or sun, doomed, like the rest, to annihilation. The Aztecs knew of the great ruined city of Teotihuacan, to the northeast of their island capital, and said that the gods had met there to create our present era, and the sun that was to give it life and substance. It was not until the first decades of the 20th century that the new science of archaeology began to render the outlines of the real prehistory of Mexico and its peoples. The first stratigraphic excavation carried out in the Valley of Mexico demonstrated not only that Teotihuacan was substantially earlier than Aztec, but that the Teotihuacan culture was underlain by the remains of a, f of a far simpler pottery-using people. How early were these pre-Aztec cultures? There was no real way to know, and most archaeologists were reluctant to think of these ceramic cultures as predating the Christian era. They looked enviously at the American Southwest, where dendrochronology, or tree ring dating, gave an absolute year-to-year -year chronology for the ancient adobe pueblos, and at the Mayan area, where a similarly accurate time scale had resulted from the correlation of the Maya and Christian calendars. All this was changed by the advent of radiocarbon dating in the mid-20th century. Some of the early cultures turn out to date to the beginning of the first millennium BC, and Teotihuacan proved to be a contemporary of the earlier part of the Maya classic AD 250-900 period, and had nothing to do with the Toltecs, as some had thought. The Toltecs, in fact, appeared on the scene as the classic came to an end, see below, and as the first Aztec ethno-histories had affirmed. There is general agreement among scholars about the periods or stages of development in, in pre-conquest Mexico, excuse me, even though certain details remain unclear. The first occupation here, called early hunters, identical to the Paleo-Indian period of some specialists, and extends from the time of the earliest migrants into the area, a topic still under debate, until about 7000 BC. During this era, People lived in tiny, nomadic bands, following a way of life centered on the hunting of now-extinct large game and on the collection of wild plant foods. During the subsequent archaic or incipient agricultural period, ancestral Mexicans began to domesticate those food plants, above all maize, upon which all subsequent civilizations in this hemisphere rested. With the introduction of pottery and village life at about 1800 BC, the pre-classic or formative period opens, lasting until circa A.D. 150. It was once considered that the pre-classic was some sort of New World counterpart to the Old World Neolithic, but radiocarbon dating and field archaeology have shown that Olmec and other ancient civilizations flourished in this epoch. The classic period, which follows on its heels, marks the apogee of Mexican civilization, with the rise and decline of mighty states like those of Teotihuacan and Monte Alban. The epic classic witnesses decline of these two giants, while smaller, innovative such cities as El Tajin replaced the classic powers in the Mesoamerican world. During these latter two periods, the lowland Maya civilization to the east experienced its zenith, with cities dotting the jungle, several of which had important ties to Mexican peoples. Many Maya and Mexican cities were extinguished or fast fading by AD 900 to be replaced by the supposedly more militaristic states of the post-classic, beginning with the Toltecs and culminating in the great empire of the Aztecs. First encountered by the Spaniards in 1519, Aztec civilization was still in full flower until it was finally dis destroyed by the intruders in 1521, bringing at least 15,000 years of Native American prehistory and history to a tragic end. 